In this video, we're going to explain exactly how to write up the conclusion chapter for a dissertation, thesis, or any other kind of formal academic research project. We'll walk you through the process step by step so that you can craft your conclusion with confidence. So grab a cup of coffee, grab a cup of tea, whatever works for you, and let's jump into it. Hey, welcome to Grad Coach TV, where we demystify and simplify the oftentimes intimidating world of academic research. My name's Emma, and today we're gonna explore the conclusion chapter, which is typically the final major chapter in a dissertation or thesis. The conclusion chapter follows on from the discussion chapter, where you interpret your analysis findings in relation to your research questions and the existing literature. If you wanna learn about the discussion chapter, we've got another video specifically covering that. I'll include a link in the description below. If you're new to Grad Coach TV, be sure to hit the subscribe button for more videos covering all things research related. Also, if you're looking for hands-on help with your research, check out our one-on-one -on -one coaching services, where we help you craft your research project step by step. It's like having a friendly professor in your pocket whenever you need it. If that sounds interesting to you, you can learn more and book a free consultation at www.gradcoach.com. All right, with that out of the way, let's get into it. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of how to write up the conclusion chapter, it's useful to take a step back and ask the questions, what exactly is the conclusion chapter and what purpose does it serve? If you understand both the what and the why, you'll have a much clearer direction in terms of the how. So what's the conclusion chapter all about? As I mentioned, the conclusion chapter is typically the final major chapter in a standard dissertation or thesis. As such, it serves as a concluding summary of your research findings and neatly wraps up the document. While some publications, like journal articles and research reports, combine the discussion and conclusion sections, these are generally separate chapters in a dissertation or thesis. That being said, it's always a good idea to check in with your research supervisor or faculty to find out what their structural preference is. Naturally, you should do this before you start writing up these chapters. So, what's the difference between the discussion and the conclusion chapter? Well, the two chapters are quite similar, as they both discuss the key findings of the study. However, the conclusion chapter is typically more general and high-level in nature. In your discussion chapter, you'll typically discuss the intricate details of your study, but in your conclusion chapter, you'll take a broader perspective, reporting on the main research outcomes and how these address your research aim. A core function of the conclusion chapter is to synthesize all the major points covered in your study and to tell the reader what they should take away from your work. Basically, you need to tell them what you found, why it's valuable, how it can be applied, and what further research can be done. Whatever you do, don't just copy and paste what you've written in your discussion chapter over into the conclusion. The conclusion chapter should not be a quick rehash of the discussion chapter. As I mentioned, while the two chapters are similar, they have distinctly different functions. Okay, with that out of the way, it's time to take a look at what you need to include and exclude in your conclusion chapter. Let's do it. Okay, so let's take a look at what goes into the conclusion chapter and what stays out of it. To understand what needs to go into your conclusion chapter, it's useful to understand what the chapter needs to achieve. Generally speaking, a good conclusion chapter should achieve the following five things. Number one, it should summarize the key findings of the study. Number two, it should answer the research questions and address the research aims. Number three, it should inform the reader of the study's main contributions. Number four, it should discuss any limitations or weaknesses of the study. And number five, it should make recommendations for future research. 
Again, keep in mind that these requirements may vary depending on your university's structural preferences. For example, they may prefer that you discuss the limitations in an earlier chapter. So check in with your research advisor to make sure you're on the same page. Whatever the case may be, you need to be careful not to include any new findings or data points in your conclusion chapter. This chapter should be based purely on data and analysis findings that you've already presented in earlier chapters. If there's a new point you want to introduce here, you'll need to go back to your results and discussion chapters to weave the foundation in. In many cases, readers will jump from the introduction chapter directly to the conclusion chapter to get a quick overview of the study's purpose and key findings. So, when you write up your conclusion chapter, it's useful to assume that the reader hasn't sunk their teeth into the inner chapters of your dissertation or thesis. In other words, craft your conclusion chapter such that there is a strong connection and a smooth flow between the introduction and conclusion chapters, even though they're on opposite ends of your document. Right, with those foundations laid down, it's time to look at how you can go about writing up the conclusion chapter. Let's do it. Now that you have a clearer view of what the conclusion chapter is all about, let's break down the structure of this chapter so that you can get to writing. Keep in mind that this is merely a typical structure. It's not set in stone or universal. Some universities will prefer that you cover some of these points in the discussion chapter, or that you cover the points at different levels in different chapters. Step one, craft a brief introduction section. As with all chapters in your dissertation or thesis, the conclusion chapter needs to start with a brief introduction. In this introductory section, you need to tell the reader what they can expect to find in the chapter and in what order. Here's an example of what this might look like. This chapter will conclude the study by summarizing the key research findings in relation to the research aims and research questions, as well as the value and contribution thereof. It will also review the limitations of the study and propose opportunities for further research. Importantly, the objective here is just to give the reader a taste of what is to come, not a summary of the chapter. It's basically just a little roadmap to help the reader orient themselves. So keep it short and sweet. A paragraph or two should be more than enough. With the introduction laid down, you can move on to the next step. Step two, discuss the overall findings in relation to the research aims. The next step in writing your conclusion chapter is to discuss the overall findings of your study as they relate to the research aims and research questions. As I mentioned earlier, you would have likely covered similar ground in the discussion chapter. So it's important to zoom out a little bit here and focus on the broader findings, specifically how these help address the research aims, not just the specific research questions. In other words, you need to explain the big picture to your reader. In practical terms, it's useful to start this section by reminding your reader of your research aims so that your discussion is well contextualized. In this section, phrases such as, this study aimed to, and the results indicate that, will likely come in handy. For example, you could say something like the following. This study aimed to investigate the feeding habits of the naked mole rat. The results indicate that naked mole rats feed on underground roots and tubers. Further findings show that these creatures eat only a part of the plant, leaving essential parts to ensure long-term food stability. A word of warning, be careful not to make overly bold claims here. Avoid claims such as, the study proves, or the findings disprove the existing theory. It's seldom the case that a single study can prove or disprove something. Typically, this is achieved by a body of research, not a single study, especially not a dissertation or a thesis project, which will inherently have significant constraints and limitations. We'll discuss those limitations a little later. Step three, discuss how your study contributes to the field. 
Next, you'll need to discuss how your research has contributed to the field, both in terms of theory and practice. To do this, you'll need to talk about what you achieved in your study, highlight why this is important and valuable, and how it can be used or applied in academia and or in practice. In this section, you should try to cover the following ground. One, mention any research outputs created as a result of your study. For example, articles you published, scales and measures you developed, etc. Two, explain how your research solves your research problem and why that matters. Three, reflect on the gaps in the existing research and explain how your study helps plug those gaps. Four, discuss your study in relation to relevant theories. For example, does it confirm existing theories or constructively challenge them? Five, discuss how your research findings can be applied in the real world. For example, what specific actions can practitioners take based on your findings? A tip here, be careful to strike a careful balance between being firm but humble. It's unlikely that your single study will fundamentally change paradigms or shake up the discipline. So making claims to this effect will likely be frowned upon. At the same time though, don't downplay the contribution of your work. Present your arguments with confidence and firmly state the contribution you've made, no matter how small that contribution may be. Knowledge is developed one tiny step at a time. Claim your step. Step four, reflect on the limitations of your study. Now that you've explained the value of your research, the next step is to critically reflect on the limitations and potential shortcomings. You may have already covered this in the discussion chapter, depending on your university or advisor's structural preferences. So be careful not to repeat yourself unnecessarily. There are many potential limitations that a study can suffer from. Some common ones include sampling issues that reduce the generalizability of the findings. For example, non-probability sampling, not getting enough survey responses or limited data access, having to use relatively low resolution data collection or analysis techniques, suffering from researcher bias or just a lack of research experience, having limited access to research equipment, and possibly the most common one, experiencing time and budget constraints that limit various aspects of the study. Discussing the limitations of your research may feel self-defeating. No one wants to highlight their weaknesses, right? However, critically discussing limitations is, in fact, a hallmark of high-quality research. The reality is that all studies have limitations, even well-funded studies undertaken by professional researchers. So acknowledging these limitations adds credibility to your research by showing that you understand the limitations of your research design and methodology. Simply put, acknowledging your weaknesses is actually a strength in the world of academic research. That being said, keep an eye on your wording and be careful not to undermine your research. It's important to strike a balance between recognizing the limitations, but also highlighting the value of your research despite those limitations. Show the reader that you understand the shortcomings of your own research, that these limitations were justified given your constraints, and that you know how they can be approved upon. Doing this will earn you marks. Right, once you've laid out the limitations, it's time to move on to the final section of your conclusion. Let's check it out. Step five, make recommendations for future research. Lastly, you need to make recommendations for future studies. In other words, you need to explain how other researchers can take your study and build onto it further. This section will be largely rooted in the limitations you just discussed. For example, if one of your study's weaknesses was related to a specific data analysis method, you can make a recommendation that future researchers undertake similar research using a more sophisticated method, such as X, Y, or Z. 
another potential source of future research recommendations is any data points or analysis findings that were interesting or surprising, but not directly related to your study's research aims and research questions. In other words, findings that piqued your interest, but that you didn't explore further as they weren't relevant to your objectives. So if you observed anything that stood out in your analysis, but you didn't explore it in your discussion, you can earmark that for further exploration. As I mentioned, this section of your conclusion chapter is an opportunity to outline how other researchers can build on your study to take the research further and help develop the body of knowledge in your field. So think carefully about the new questions that your study has raised and clearly outline these for future researchers to pick up on. Step six, wrap up with a closing summary. Finally, it's time to wrap up your conclusion chapter with a brief closing summary. The closing summary should serve as a quick reference for your readers, very briefly recapping what you discussed in the conclusion chapter. Remind the reader of the key ground covered and wrap it up. Brevity is key here. Don't ramble on restating all the details. Also, make sure that you don't present any new information here. In practical terms, this section should be about a paragraph or two max. Keep it short and sweet. Now that you understand what the conclusion chapter is about, what to include and exclude, and how to write it up, here are some quick tips to help you craft a quality chapter. Number one, don't ramble. The conclusion chapter usually constitutes five to 7% of the total word count. Although this will of course vary between universities. So you need to be concise. Edit this chapter thoroughly with a focus on brevity and clarity. Two, be very careful about the claims you make in terms of your study's contribution. Nothing will make the marker's eyes roll back faster than exaggerated or unfounded claims. Be humble but firm in your claim making. Three, use clear and simple language that can be easily understood by an intelligent layman. Remember, not every reader will be an expert in your field, so you need to make your writing accessible. No one knows your research better than you do, so it's important to spell things out clearly for readers. Four, once you've completed your chapter, ask a friend to read your introduction and your conclusion chapters only then ask them to explain what the study was about and what the findings were. This will provide you with valuable insight as to how well you've communicated the gist of your study and will help you identify what needs more fleshing out. If you incorporate these tips into your writing process and follow the structure we've discussed in this video, you can rest assured that your conclusion chapter will be headed in a good direction. All right, so that wraps it up for today. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button and leave a comment if you have any questions. Also, be sure to subscribe to the Grad Coach channel for more research-related content. If you need a helping hand with your research, remember to check out our private coaching service where we work with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis, chapter by chapter, to help you craft a winning dissertation or thesis. If that sounds interesting to you, book a free consultation with a friendly coach at gradcoach.com. As always, I'll include a link below. And that's all for this episode of Grad Coach TV. Until next time, good luck.